Hi, this is Pastor Bob Yandy, and today I'm teaching on family lines in the Word of God following Jesus. When the parents get born again, the children can be born again and follow in the things of God. Jesus had two brothers, James and Jude. James became a pastor. Jude also became an apostle of the Lord later on, but both wrote books of the New Testament. Jesus' sisters went on to marry ministers. History tells us this. That's why the Word of God says, train your children up in the ways of the Lord. When they're older, they'll not depart from it. Oh, the power of God in a family. Let's go to the Word of God together. For more than 40 years, Bob Yandian has been an expositor of the Bible, making seemingly complicated doctrine easy to understand. Grab your Bible and study the Word of God with Pastor Bob Yandian. Hello, this is Pastor Bob Yandy, and welcome back again to Student of the Word. Glad to have you here today. Uh, in my family, I'm just going to go, in fact, find James, if you would, chapter one. We're going to go to chapter one of James. So while you're finding that, I came out of a family of ministry. My dad was the first one in his family that he knows of that received Jesus as Savior. My mom, although she said there were some Christians way back there, so what, she was the first one that she knows of that received Jesus, but also that they truly followed after God and wanted to raise their family in the ways of God. So my father was a pastor, I became a pastor. My dad loved God, was a great teacher. I also have done the same thing. My son is in the ministry today, an associate pastor of a very large church. And uh, my daughter is in praise and worship. So again, we have family members who've gone on to follow the Lord. And we find this is true in the word of God, that one lineage is made up when one gives their life to the Lord. It so affects the generations after that. And a lot of times in churches, you'll see a uh, man that's passionate of the church, he'll turn it over to his son or to his grandson or something like that. That's not always the case, but much of the case is that because again, being raised in a church family, a Christian family following God and the importance of the church, that calling comes right on to the son or the daughter to follow in the ministry. And so the book I'm offering uh, for this particular teaching, I'm calling this Family Lines of Ministry, but the book I'm offering is the book of Proverbs. Throughout the book of Proverbs, what Solomon says is there, he always uses the term, my, my son, my son, to kick off numerous scriptures throughout the book of Proverbs because this is what he learned from his father who was a king and a minister. Guess exactly what happened to Solomon. He became a king and he became a minister. Nowhere near what his father was, all right? He was called the wisest man next to Jesus because Jesus called him that. You'd think if he was the wisest man that ever existed next to Jesus, then he's the one we should look up to. No, he didn't have the heart of his father. And David is said to be a man after God's own heart. And, and really, to be truthful, Solomon didn't have God's heart. He eventually turned and became uh, pretty much self-absorbed. And everything he got was for himself. And even though, again, I mean, he this was a man who sinned immensely and was carnal for so long, but yet the end of his life came back to the Lord. And in the closing of the book of Ecclesiastes, he simply said this after an entire book of searching everywhere, trying to find happiness, he finally said this, here's the secret to it, serve the Lord from a young age. So so again, we find him in there, but again, he was a good uh, overall king for Israel, but nowhere near what his father David was. So in the book of James, what we have here is James and Jude were both uh, brothers of the humanity of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Joseph and Mary were their physical mother and father. Of course, Jesus' mother, as far as his physical body was concerned, was Mary, but his father was God, who not only brought him into this earth, but birthed his human body. I mean, he, he, he provided the seed. God's seed came into Mary and Jesus Christ was formed inside of her. But as far as the natural side of it, we could, we could call them half-brothers. James and Jude were half-brothers of Jesus. Their names are mentioned in the book of Matthew. But here we have James writing his book, and guess what? It started with Jesus, went down to James, went down to Jude, and we find throughout history that Jesus' uh, family were very much involved in ministry. Once it starts in a family line, it just can keep on going. Let's look at James chapter 1, verses 1 through 8, then we'll jump to verse 13. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, greetings. My brothers, count it all joy when you fall into different kinds of temptation temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith works patience, but let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all men liberally and does not upbraid, and it shall be given to him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he who wavers is like a wave of the sea driven by the wind and tossed. Let not that man think he'll receive anything from the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in 
than all of his ways. Jump to verse 13. Let no man say when he is tempted or tested, I'm being tested by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither does he tempt any man, fill in the blank with evil. He's talking about evil here. Not that God doesn't try us and God doesn't even test us, but he doesn't do it with evil. He does it with good. God is not the one who dangles adultery in front of your eyes, prostitution in front of your eyes. He's not the one that that hangs drugs in front of your eyes. That's the world and Satan himself. God doesn't tempt you that evil way, but he'll send blessings in your life. But even those become a test for you. Will you still follow after God and not chase after the blessing? And so in this, I want you to notice something here, though, at the opening of this book of James. James never said one time, I am a brother of Jesus Christ. Boy, wouldn't that have been a good thing, huh? I mean, there's times when Peter mentioned he was one of the 12. But to actually be a physical brother of Jesus, not a true total brother of Jesus, but to say, I'm at least a half brother of Jesus, he never even did that. Neither did Jude. At the opening of his book, he never mentioned his relationship with Jesus. And here we find again, neither did James. Many ministers have children involved in the ministry. Devout Christians usually have Christian children. Those in music ministry, praise and worship have children involved in Christian worship. James was the half brother of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as he grew up, he didn't like his brother Jesus. In fact, he didn't even become a believer until after Jesus' resurrection. In Mary's family, there were many ministers after Jesus went on. Jesus himself was the minister. Of course, the chief of all ministers. Then came Jude. Then came James. And history even tells us that Jesus' two sisters married ministers. There's something different in the DNA of a minister, which often gets into the children. This doesn't happen every time, but the bulk of the time it does. Many become ministers or associated with the ministry in one way or another. Ministers' children can handle tribulation better than most because they've seen both sides of Christians growing up in a church. Many times Christian kids want to flee from the church that their dad pastored and oftentimes just want to get away from it from all they see. But later on, they begin to understand something. There's a call on their life. They have to get back, but they can actually see the trials and troubles that their dad, their mom went through all those years pastoring that church actually benefited them so they can be coming into a church with their eyes wide open Not every Christian is a wonderful, spirit-filled person that loves Jesus and loves the church. People come to church for all types of reasons, and not all of them are good reasons. So the believers who fled Jerusalem and Israel at the persecution were scattered abroad. It says here, sown as seed. The Greek word is diaspora. And dia means to be, you know, to spread out and spora means seed. So like seed being sown, they were scattered everywhere. And of course, some of them were ministers' kids. As they were scattered abroad, they would start churches in many areas. What was meant by Satan to destroy the believers only caused them to increase. The persecution that came on the church that caused Christians to run and go in different directions, what happens was once those believers landed in different countries, they grew strong, they birthed other people into the kingdom of God, and then started churches. What a great example we see in Paul's ministry as he went to these places and got saw people saved, and signs and wonders and miracles followed his ministry. And signs and wonders and miracles are a means of drawing people to receiving Jesus as Lord and Savior. They are a really a means of witnessing. They're not just intended to alleviate pain and see people healed. They are to startle people that if that disease could not be healed naturally, there was no way that incurable disease could be healed. If God could heal that, which is temporary, Only as long as you live on this earth, then he must be able to do what else we cannot see, and that is give us eternal life. So by seeing something physical, people now receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. Matthew chapter 9 and verse 6, Jesus even said, I'm going to heal this man to show you that I have power to remove sin also. Healing was the outward manifestation that Jesus could remove sin. So the Jewish believers had been so long away from New Testament teaching that after a while, some of them reverted back to Old Testament viewpoints of God's sovereignty. God is responsible for all good and all bad in our lives. Now, of course, that isn't true. We know that from the word of God, but somehow because of that, they went back to those old teachings. But here's the point. When they went out and started churches, became involved in those churches, got great pastors in them, the people could be blessed and prospered. I can't help but think of the end of chapter 18 
18 of Acts, all of chapter 19 and all of chapter 20, which come around and revolve around the, re the revival that started at Ephesus. Paul came to this city and uh, whenever he came there, again, he found a hunger in that town. Ephesus was one of the strongest sin capitals of the world, again, much like Las Vegas is today. And the people that lived there were caught up in, all, listen, a heathenism that they had included uh, prostitution, sexual uh, you know, arousal for men and women in the temple. They had the priestesses. They also had the men that were uh, considered workers in the temple, and they gave themselves totally over to sex. And when you wanted a good time and they would come from everywhere, you always thought of Ephesus because of all the sexual activity that went on there. But because of that, there was a lot of demonic activity going on around the city. All this sin promoted as a means of righteousness was really what Paul did not come to change that. He came because there was hunger in the city. When you have people that are so occupied with sin, 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 they begin to find out, well, there's pleasure in it, but it doesn't last very long. Is there anything that gives longer pleasure than just going and having sex with somebody or gambling or doing whatever we do here or buying a little silver statue of Diana? How does that help me? They begin to hunger and Paul dropped by Ephesus and found a hunger there he hadn't found anywhere else. And it started really when he went into the place, uh, the, uh, he went to minister in the synagogue and there he even found Jews were open. The first time ever he spoke to Jews about Jesus and the new covenant that they didn't kick him out. The first city that didn't kick him out after a while, when he went to the city of Jerusalem for the Feast of Pentecost, they begged him to stay, please don't go. And he said, no, I've got to, but I promise you, if I come back this way, I will come to you. And of course he did leave and others filled in his place while he was gone. So he came back later, but that hunger and thirst was there and revival spread out throughout that city, lasted for three years. During that time, Paul raised up churches in homes and in chapter 20, he then went to visit all the ministers who had, who had opened up churches in the city of Ephesus and the revival that had taken place there. And again, the, and the Bible says because of that three-year revival, the entire continent of Asia was shaken. Here we have again, those in the ministry, but oftentimes again, those are held out through the years that sons of ministers became ministers and children of ministers became ministers, and grandchildren of ministers became ministers. The thing just keeps going and going, and what a wonderful plan that God has. So again, we find out in the Word of God, this is what God has intended for families, that families raise their children in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord, and as Joshua said in the Old Testament, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. While those kids are living there, it's up to you to set the standards, Father, so that those kids go to church. Parents, you set the standard that you're faithful to go to church, faithful to in, be involved in the things of God, and faithful to raise your children in that. So we have here again that God is not the one who uses evil to try our faith. It's Satan that does so. We'll talk a little bit more about that when we come back after halftime. Many Christians are quick to confess all that they are, all that they have, and all they can do. They appear to overflow in knowledge of righteousness, healing, authority, and many other spiritual truths. Yet for all this spiritual knowledge, many of these same people are foolish and unlearned when it comes to the practical things of Christian life. As James said, my brethren, these things ought not be so. The book of Proverbs is a prime source of the wisdom we need for daily existence, and a close study of it is well worth our time and attention. In Proverbs, Wisdom for Today, Bobby Andian discusses what wisdom is, its benefits, how to find it, where it comes from, and how to receive it in order to help you live a life of wisdom. To order Proverbs, Wisdom for Today, go to bobyandian.com. Theology Simplified is a practical guide to foundational biblical truth. Basic doctrines are not difficult, but easy to understand. They often become disguised as complicated or deep-sounding words, but the definitions are simple. Pastor Bob makes complex theological concepts clear and practical. Eight crucial doctrines of the Christian faith are demystified. Redemption, justification, sanctification, reconciliation, predestination, election, propitiation, and glorification. These eight precepts, essential for all believers to understand, come to light as you read and arrive at a deeper understanding of the finished work of Jesus Christ. To order Theology Simplified, visit our website 
at bobbyandian.com. Bob Yandian Ministries is training up a new generation in the Word of God. Because of your generosity, this teaching ministry is able to change countless lives. You will never know until you get to heaven how many people received Jesus, were filled with the Holy Spirit, healed, or found God's will for their life through your support and prayers. If you would like to become a partner with Bob Yandian, visit bobyandian.com and click on Partnership. Again, the book that I'm offering for this particular broadcast is my book on the book of Proverbs. Proverbs is so important. Again, where uh, throughout the book, when Solomon keeps referring to that phrase, my son, my son, these are things he learned in his home as he was growing up that stayed with him all those years. And even though he got off track, he kept coming back because why? If you raise your children in the nurture, in the admonition of the Lord, when they're old, they'll not depart from it. Doesn't say they may not try through the years, but you know what? There's something that's bound around them because of what the parents taught them in the word of God that will eventually bring them back. That's the good news of it. So again, the book is so important in the book. I also teach here on the view of God's view of marriage, the importance of marriage, but also your children. There's chapters in the book of Proverbs that I bring out in here on teaching your children about sex. Now, some of you, when you start to hear that, you think, well, you know, I'm just going to let, I'm not going to do that. I I just don't feel comfortable doing that. Well, listen, if you don't teach them, someone's going to teach them. And you don't want to be done in the public schools. You don't want the world system entering in. You need to tell them directly from the word of God what the word of God has to say. And then just, you know, uh, take your shyness and all that and just put it to the back and just simply present it. And they'll be so glad and so will you after it's done to find out what the word of God has to say. So be sure and get yourself a copy of that book. Here's what happened was, again, churches were being established everywhere. And and from the city of Jerusalem, they were spread about because of the persecution. And we find out here that, that a couple of the churches this was happening was the church of Jerusalem. And this again is the one that James was pastoring. Jude later on again, as a brother of Jesus Christ, was also spreading the word of God everywhere. So we find this happening. But because that, we not only have Jesus, we have his brothers here doing the same thing. And we have ministers and their ministers' children. Uh, Again, with David and Solomon, we have David as a king and also a minister, raising up a son who became a king and a minister, and both wrote books in the word of God. So again, this is what we have. But what happens is, is the gospel spreads. This first generation begins to die off, but the results of it keep on going. And oftentimes through our own children, as they get into the ministry. But what happened was too, when the Jews went out and and started these other churches, a lot of times that they found themselves getting back into, such as in the book of Galatians, they got into legalism back under the law. And so uh, what they began to look at was one of the things that comes out in the Old Testament, there was a lot of blaming of God for bad situations as well as good. Now, I will admit God does send bad situations, but he, but he curses the habitation of the sinner and blesses the habitation of the just. There's times when God has taken curses and sent them down on nations that rejected him for so long he had no other way to go. Uh, in the case of Egypt, 400 years God gave them to repent and finally at the end, as Pharaoh kept challenging God and challenging God every time he was met with a curse from God and the purpose of the curse was to drive him toward the Lord, he would momentarily do that and then he would uh, and then he would then he wouldn't do it. And so he'd repent for a moment and go no 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 and turn from it and a number of times it says you know that he hardened his own heart and finally by the end that when he rejected God so much then God hardened his heart. God removed all of the uh all of the barriers around him that was keeping him and and removed them so that now God removed the obstacles that was keeping him from rejecting God. And now again, he just opened himself up more to to, uh, be against God. And those curses came into his life. And finally, his entire troops died and the firstborn died and cattle died and all this other stuff. He lost the riches of his own kingdom as they went out with the Jews into the wilderness. So we find this again. And so because the Old Testament, especially in the book of Job, where Job said this, and it's really not a true statement in the pressure, he said this, well, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Well, if you remember in the opening of the book of Job, it was the Lord that gave and Satan that took away. The opening two chapters tell this. But because of that type of theology and an overlooking at an over mentioning of the sovereignty of God, people often say, well, in sovereignty, God sends evil to you, good to you. We don't understand God, but that's literally not the case. All right. God is not the one who uses evil to try our faith. That's Satan. This is why James tells his congregation, don't even let the words come out of your mouth 
that I am being tempted by the Lord. If we endure temptation, that's Satan coming against us and the world coming against us and our flesh coming against us, the reward is more patience and endurance. The end result of our life is going to be maturity perfection in the things of God, growth in the things of God, and a wanting and a lack for nothing. God's role in testing is this. God is ready to answer any request for wisdom that we have. And we have during persecution and testing, God will never ridicule us for asking, but freely give in abundance. If we keep our eyes on the word of God, And also on the trials of life, we can become double-minded. A double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways, and he tells us that here. The word double-minded literally is the word double soul. The Greek word for soul is mentioned here in these verses of Scripture. And it simply says a double-souled man is unstable in all of his ways. In essence, it's simply saying this is like a man with two heads. You know, uh, I've been in churches, they often talk about, well, the church is so big, we need another pastor. You know, well, that's like saying because you get real fat, you need another head. That's like saying, you know, if your family gets to have 20 kids, you need two husbands around, two fathers. No, or like the kingdom of God gets so big that we need a second Jesus sitting in heaven. No, what happens is his delegation. And so it's simply saying here that oftentimes whenever we get our eyes on the word of God, but we also get on the trials of life and we look back and forth and we just don't make a decision. We're like a wave tossed backward and forward, backward and forward by the circumstances of life. We become double-minded, double soul, and we become unstable in all of our ways. One head wants to do one thing and the other head wants to do another. But like anything with two heads, we become a freak and this is not what God is looking for. Let's come back to this. Why does God mention all these things and why does James keep bringing these things up? Because the answer to all these things is what he found in his own home. And that was the teaching of the word of God. You know, he really wasn't saved until after Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. I'm talking about James himself. Even though Jesus Christ was his brother, he did not understand his brother. There was even one time where he told, I mean, he literally told Jesus off and told him to stop doing the things he was doing. It wasn't until, I guess what, you come into is this. Once Jesus is raised from the dead, you certainly have to change your mind about your brother. I mean, can you imagine being in school as he was and talking, somebody talking about Jesus and, you know, and, and they say, well, what's your, I mean, we heard he spoke to, you know, as he was growing up, we heard that your brother spoke at one of the synagogues one day and just blew the minds of all the Pharisees and goes, yeah, my, my brother thinks he's God. You know, I'm sure there was that kind of jesting in his own mind. He didn't like being raised around Jesus. Jesus seemed to be a know-it-all, but one thing he couldn't argue with was Jesus had a great attitude, but would not put up with unbelief. So when Jesus got older, we find out that he still resisted Jesus, even in the days where Jesus had his disciples. It wasn't until the resurrection that he honestly accepted Jesus, his own physical brother, half-brother, and realized he's more than my brother. He is also the son of God. And so by receiving him as Lord and Savior, he then entered into the ministry later on. But I guess there's something about your brother dying on a cross and then being resurrected from the dead that might change your mind. Maybe he really is the Messiah. Maybe he really is the son of God. And maybe my mother Mary is the one who fulfilled the promise in the book of Isaiah, that a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. That was my mom. And before they were ever married, she became pregnant by the Holy Spirit. And Jesus Christ is what was born out of that relationship. So again, we come back to it. This is what happens. But the purpose of what I'm saying here is this. This is the importance of training your children in the things of God so that when you're gone, that heritage keeps on going. We're told in the book of Timothy that a woman is saved in childbearing. That doesn't mean she have to have children to go to heaven and be safe. No, she's spared in childbearing. The thing of it is, is as they continue in the things of God, they are the children. When the children continue in the things of God, the things that especially the mother and the father also have placed into them, that what happens to them as they continue to go on, you receive in essence a redemption in life, a proving yourself right, that you raise your kids. The thing that the father does mainly is he goes to work, brings the finances home. He's the bread for the family. And yes, he helps in the teaching of the kids, but the main ones that constantly is there is the woman, the mother, as she trains those children. And as those children grow up and go off and leave the home, what happens is she is in essence rewarded back for what Satan did in the garden when he came and a division was made between the woman 
and Satan. But when the woman raises up children, in essence, she separates herself from that curse because her kids go on and are raised up to be even better than her. The following generation gets better and better in the things of God. This is why, again, a family needs to be training their children the ways of God. We are not a local church, but we supplement the local church. Or I like to think of it this way. Oftentimes, the church is the supplement for the home. The church has you for maybe an hour and a half on Sunday. Your kids maybe an hour in a children's church, youth department, maybe going on a you know a camping thing with the kids or going off to camp somewhere, going to vacation, Bible school, those things from time to time, but you cannot live on that. You as an adult can't live on that. Your children can't. You need to have the word of God in your home. The book of Deuteronomy to me is one of the greatest things that lines up with the book of Proverbs of which I'm offering on this broadcast, the book of Proverbs, but also the book of Deuteronomy is the same instruction given in Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers to the first generation. Deuteronomy, the Hebrew means to say it again. This is the saying of the same thing to the second generation and talks about the importance of parents training their children, teaching their children. When they rise up in the morning, you do this. When they come back home at night and to take the word of God and make it an integral part of your life not to just have a time when you have a family altar and teach your children, although that's fine, but life itself should be teaching. As you're watching television, say, kids, we see this movie, we're not gonna turn it off, but you ought to be able to tell what's wrong about their their thinking in this movie, what's wrong about their philosophy. I want you to enjoy the movie without picking up the philosophy that's there. What we're doing is not isolating our children from the world, we are insulating them from the world. That that way they'll be able to go out from the house, be able to see the things of the world without being in influenced by them. They're influenced by the word of God they've taken. The same word that made my mom and dad so full of the word of God and made them so wise in the things of God has been transferred to me. And now when I have children, the way my parents taught me, I'm going to teach my children. In fact, I've learned other things I can teach my children from the word of God. This uh, literally, this knowledge increases from generation to generation. The wisdom increases from generation to generation. And again, this is all happening within the confines of the home. The greatest place children can find Jesus as Lord and Savior and grow in the things of God, in the Word of God, is within the home. That's the best place to get them saved. That's the best, best place for them to follow after God and take it from their own. Whenever they grow up, let's go to get their first job. As they go out there, it's no longer mom and dad following them to make sure they're okay. The Word of God follows them. Whenever they go to bed at night and after they've left the house and they may be living on their own in an apartment with some other kids or whatever, or they get married and have moved in with their uh, with their wives or their husbands, it's no longer you that's there around the bed to, to pray with them at night. They pray themselves. They open up their eyes in the morning and the first thing they think of is the word of God. Mom and dad aren't here, but the God of mom and dad are here. This is the importance of the family and the generations that come, all coming back to the importance and power of the Word of God. I'll see you next time. You can order resources, become a partner, or browse free articles and podcasts by visiting our website at bobyandian.com. Join our mailing list and receive weekly devotions and the latest ministry updates. If you would like to contact Bob Yandian Ministries, visit bobyandian.com and click on Contact. To contact us by mail, use the address on your screen. Thank you for watching today's broadcast. We'll see you next time on Student of the Word with Bob Yandian.